Karen Lord. Mm, that's a good one. Well, <clears throat> science fiction is easy in the sense that there has to be some level of science involved. Where it gets more complicated is um, some people think that the hard sciences, which is to say physics, to a certain extent biology, those are the ones that define what science fiction is and is about. But I also count in social sciences. So when there are um, authors who examine new worlds by looking at different types of society, for example, um, or different um, types of human talents, like telepathy and what that means for, for personal relationships, I do very much think of those as science fiction as well. I think we're going to be working on the definition of intelligence for a very long time. Right now, we seem to think that it means that we can communicate on a certain level and receive some sort of um, level of interaction or information. And however we determine that level, we say, well, this is something that is intelligent. If you ask um, a proper psychologist or someone who's in the field, I'm sure they will tell you about things like um, the self-awareness test and so on and so forth. But we do keep shifting the pulse sometimes on what is intelligent. If you asked that question 100 years ago, you would have had a different answer. Um, and I'm sure 100 years from now, we're going to be rethinking it again. There are lots of sci-fi scenarios that have been depicted by authors and filmmakers. I sometimes think that it's impossible for one person to have not got it right, but we never know which one it's going to be. I remember um, reading about a book that was um, written around the turn of the 20th century about kind of a, a near future science fiction talking about a, a large um, sailing ship, a large ship that could not be sunk, and how it did in fact hit an iceberg and went down, and this was all before the Titanic happened. So sometimes things are written and they seem very far-fetched or they seem not very important, but those are the things that more accurately depict what could happen in the future. I don't have to use as much paper. <laughs> I, I can write, I can save my, um, my manuscripts in the cloud or um, on my computer, and I don't have to print out literal physical pages and do my edits and, you know, how they used to cut and paste, actually cut and paste things. That required, I think, a level of, of resources even, and, and also space that I don't need to have now. I can quite literally work at a coffee shop, um, work on an airplane, and get a lot of work done in a way that I wouldn't have been able to in the days of working on a typewriter. Hmm. I will give an example, and you can tell me if you're, this is what you're referring to. A friend of mine, Tobias Bakel, writes um, science fiction that's near future about climate change. He has said recently that he was too conservative in his estimates. He wrote a, a book about the Arctic being ice free and a rush for resources to the Arctic. He said it a certain number of years ahead. He said this is happening far faster than I expected. So perhaps like that, that can definitely happen. Um, of course, the reverse also happens where people think they're going to get jet packs and colonies on Mars and, and that doesn't happen 50 years down the line. It's not even looking like 100 years down the line we will see that. We are not that accurate in our predictions. That is a fascinating question which I have never considered. Mm. I think that if you could have an AI that was like a librarian 
who would not only help you search for information, but do it in a way that was um, very meaningful, pulling themes and threads together and able to suggest to you things that were actually useful, I'd be very tempted by that. I'm going to push back against that question because I think that the fact that authors die is what can make their work more precious to us. If an author just becomes an algorithm that you can crank out like, you know, another Sherlock Holmes, it, to me it doesn't feel as if it has the same value as the original author. But there's nothing to stop that happening, and I suppose I would love to have more books in the Discworld series by Terry Pratchett. I'd written my first book, and the first book left some questions unanswered. I also won an award for the manuscript of my first book, and I was happy to get the award, but I was also terrified. I thought, I need to write a second book as quickly as possible so they don't think I'm just a one-hit wonder. So it was partly to challenge myself, but partly to resolve some threads in the first book that I felt had not been tied up neatly. Not that a story needs to have everything tied up neatly, but the central question of what redemption is, I felt that could be explored and expanded, and that's what Unraveling became. I think anything that expands on navigation would be of most interest to me. Um, I mean, we we're talking about you know tour guides and people showing you the city and so forth. And yes, to a certain extent, I can put an address into maps and it will tell me how to get there and so forth. But to be able to go to a completely new place and have a level of um, search and intelligence that allows you to live immediately there as if you'd known it for a full year, I think that there's a, a certain amount of power in that because you would just never be a stranger anywhere. You can just fit in as if you'd always been there. <laughs>